it is my great privilege to introduce to you the world's foremost <laughs> nurse informaticist, <laughs> Patricia Flatley Brennan. No pressure. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. No pressure up here. Good afternoon. Um, I, too, want to pause and recognize my friend, my colleague, our teacher, Lena. Uh, many things to many people, and for the most part, for our lives, as we move through, the hugs that Lena gave us will stay with us. Now I'm going to move over to my talk. Okay. Lena would appreciate that we didn't dally. This afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about listening in the moment. I'm going to give you some of the experiences we've had in project health design. And these should resonate both with things from Dr. Gottlieb as well as comments from Susanna Fox yesterday and Sherry Turkle. When we want to understand people, we must listen in the moment of their lives. I'm going to explore with you the practical implications of observing daily living with people from their perspective. This is absolutely critical. Now, I'm not sure Danny Sands is here in the audience, but he has enjoyed this diagram, and it's not just for Danny to see. I want you to begin to think about the care between the care. How do we listen to the experience of everyday people by thinking first about what we do best, which is professional care. The diagram on the back depicts a year in the life of a person who's had a heart attack, an MI. At the beginning of the year, they're whomped into the ICU, lots of things around them, or maybe they're sent home in four hours now, I don't really know. They go through the system, they get cardiac rehab, they get medications that were tagged with an RFID tag for inventory management. They see clinicians and clinicians and they get imaging studies and they're in the end of the year they're actually better because, as Dr. Gottlieb indicated, we do wonderful medicine around this country. But largely in health and health IT, we have focused on the vertical lines in this diagram. We have built information tools in little silos that fit only in those narrow spaces where they come to us. And now it's time to think about us going to them. How do we address, how do we listen, how do we know what arises in between the care needs? And who can tell us that best but the patients? Remember, most importantly, that while professionals are expert in clinical care, people are experts in everyday living. And for this entire room, I want to remind you, you never ever give up being a patient, but you also never give up being a professional. And so it's hard for us to, hard for us to know what it's like to be a 14-year-old mother having her second baby, or a 37-year-old father having his first heart attack, or a 67-year-old woman with diabetes who's alone and homeless. It is hard for us to know, even though we've all been patients, we've not been patients free of the protection of our professional lives. Now I want you to, to say we must listen to those who lack that mantle, lack that protection. Now, I have been privileged to work through the Project Health Design program with groups around the country, with 14 of them, and we've learned to listen to the, uh, the experience of people in everyday living. And what they've told us is that they listen to something different than we think they're listening to. They're making observations in daily living, or something we now call ODLs, or God forbid people pronounce ODLs. These are the thoughts, the feelings, the behaviors and actions and exposures that individuals, that people pay attention to in their lives that activate them towards health. They're cues to action rather than indicators of pathology. So while we want them to monitor their blood pressure or their, their blood sugars, they're listening to whether or not they can sing in the choir all the way through the hymns on Sunday or listening to whether or not that baby's cry is just so much getting on their nerves they can't hear it anymore. They listen to things different, and we call these observations of daily living, and they are a new kind of data, and they are critical for those of us who want to understand the patient to be able to listen to. Now, fortunately, you don't have to listen to just me translated. I've got some stories to tell you from the Project Health Design Program. This is a program that's been running for about eight years from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We're in our last year, and we have stories to tell and stories to share. We've interacted with over 500 people in various kinds of households, city streets, public schools, elder care facilities, and we've got some new ideas of the nuances of the stories we must listen to in everyday life. Here is an example of one I'd like you to listen to. 
Project Health Design is a bold new program to create the next generation of personal health record systems. A national program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Pioneer Portfolio, Project Health Design receives additional support from the California Healthcare Foundation. Drawing on the ingenuity of nine interdisciplinary teams of grantees, the program is designing and testing personal health applications that help individuals and families better manage their health and health care. The grantees have pushed the potential of personal health records through designing PHR applications that put users' needs front and center. They go beyond access through personal computers by using increasingly powerful mobile devices. The following is a glimpse into one grantee's innovative project. My name's Jim and I just turned 36. Tina and I got married a couple of years after we graduated from high school. I found out I had diabetes the same week we learned Tina was pregnant. I felt like my life had been turned upside down. Managing my diabetes takes a lot of time and effort, but I try not to let it control my life. I still play basketball with my buddies from high school and I've taken up running. Plus, I do woodworking for a living and that's pretty physical too. Even though it's been 13 years since Kayla was born and I found out about my diabetes, things haven't gotten less crazy. We just bought a house, Tina's got a new job, and I finally decided to take the plunge and open my own cabinetry shop. With so much excitement around here, it's been harder than ever to stay on top of my diabetes. There are so many things to do, like paying attention to my blood sugars, figuring out what to eat, how much to exercise, and how much insulin I need. Understanding how all these things fit together is really tough. So I was pretty fired up when I read about a new service that coordinates all that stuff for you, right from your phone or computer. Now, I didn't know exactly what to expect, but Kayla helped me set everything up, and when I saw it was based on Google, it seemed simple enough. And I always have my cell phone, so it's easy to be able to see how I'm doing anytime I want. A couple of weeks after starting the service, I have an afternoon meeting with the bank. I need a loan to open the shop and it feels like my whole future is riding on it. I'm a nervous wreck the entire morning before the meeting, so Tina tells me to stop worrying and go for a run. Three miles in, I hear a beep. It's a text message letting me know my blood sugar level is getting low. I stop, take a couple of glucose tablets and rest before I head home. Now. Hypoglycemia is the last thing I want the day of an important meeting, so I'm glad I have this safety net. A month later, I've nailed the loan, and two months after that, I'm ready to open shop. We have a little celebration, complete with Tina's homemade cooking. The system helps me plan ahead, so my blood sugar stays on track. Before bed, I always check out my iGoogle page. These days, I'm happy to see my blood sugar levels are usually fine when I check. If I need it, the system gives me advice on different things I can do for myself, and then I can decide what's best in these special situations. The system really helps me keep my diabetes on track. I can see how what I do affects my blood sugar in different ways, like how I eat, my exercise, my medicines, and my stress. Now I get how all that stuff fits together, just like fine woodworking. Each morning, I wake up feeling great. I'm not worrying as much about my diabetes anymore because the service gives me tools I can use when I need them to take charge. So now I've got enough energy for my family and to run my own shop. Two professional teams helped grantees address concerns and take advantage of opportunities identified during project development. Experts from Sujansky & Associates worked with all nine grantee teams to identify technical requirements common to all projects and implement them in a web environment, demonstrating that a common platform can support multiple personal health application tools and that the technology for using personal health records should be separated from the record itself. As well, a team from the University of Miami Bioethics Program helped grantees identify the most pressing ethical, legal, and social issues associated with their projects, how individuals control access to their health information, how to manage privacy, and the implications of shifting personal health decisions previously shared with health professionals to consumers alone. 
Project Health Design is demonstrating a powerful vision of how personal health records and new technologies can empower people to better manage their health and health care. To learn more about Project Health Design, visit our website at projecthealthdesign.org or contact the Project Health Design National Program Office, which is based at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Nursing. That's the best part. This video and nine others now are available on our website. They give illustrations of how technology moves into the lives of people in ways that are meaningful for them and assist them to compensate for things that they are unable to get or integrate with their clinical practitioners, as Dr. Gottlieb mentioned earlier. Now, what did we learn was important to Jim? Well, you know, actually very little on this list had anything to do with diabetes. He's negotiating alone. He's opening his shop. He does feel some stress. He seems to exercise well. He knows he's got to do something with medication. Oh, yes, and he's worried about hypoglycemia. But um, most of these don't have snowman coats. And so we have to listen. We have to listen to what does this mean to a person. Now, what we've learned is that people blend their vocabularies. They use professional terms and they use person terms. So when we listen to the language of health in every day, we hear lots of different things that come out of people's mouths. They talk about things and they have personal meaning to them. They might have meaning also to clinicians. They might have meaning to others in their family. But these terms are the terms that they use to describe health. This is the, the vocabulary, the language that we need to learn to listen to. Well, some of these, if we hear only with professional ears, we miss the meaning of the person. And frankly, many of them are things that individuals use to decide whether or not they should take a glucose pill, call their doctor, or take a rest. And we need to understand, not necessarily correct, not necessarily bring them in line with us, but to understand where do they begin. And they begin with the words, the observations of daily living. Now, generally, the terms that people use tend to be patient-defined as well as patient-focused. Patient-focused is that list of terms we studied at Signs and Symptoms Clinical Indicators, CPT codes. They're patient-focused. I recognize that. But there's also this patient-defined vocabulary. We have to pay attention to this because it's unique and idiosyncratic for each individual. The observations of daily living are the experience of the person in their daily lives. They may or may not map to some SNOMED term or some anatomical structure, but that's what activates the person towards action. Clinical terms are also important, so I'd like you to think about them on this continuum. At the far end, there's the unique terms that people use. Sugar for saying they have diabetes. Troubles, meaning some type of arthritic pain in the joint. Listen to the words that they use so we can understand their experience. Now, when we begin to look at these in more depth, we recognize that they do separate out a bit, that some become more idiosyncratic to the person and some become more aligned with or mappable to clinical terminology. This is the point where the conversation with the patient begins. And as we begin to try to provide a person with the tools they need for health, we need to provide technologies that support both the language of clinicians and the experience of the patient. I fundamentally believe that the health information technologies that we're building today will achieve some of the things that Dr. Gottlieb asked for and address some of the things that Susanna was talking about yesterday in self-tracking. We will track some things that clinicians matter, blood glucose, blood pressures, but we will also track some things that matter to the person that may actually only be presented back to that individual so they can help themselves and they can achieve the health they're trying to achieve. Now, in our second round of Project Health Design, we pushed on this idea of observations in daily living to better understand it and, importantly, to figure out whether it mattered to clinicians. Does it change a clinician's care of a patient if they know the everyday experience of an individual? And we also needed to understand what do we do with these odals when we bring them into the clinical practice setting? Do we write them down on a piece of paper and then look at it and throw it out? Do we put it into the clinical record? Should they be HIPAA controlled? God only knows we don't want that to happen. But how do we bring the language, do we listen to our patients, listen in their daily lives and bring it into the clinical record? This we have some hope for, both from a technical and a regulatory standpoint. During Project Health Design Round 2, we had five teams that looked at very complex patient care problems. Elders at risk for cognitive decline, the group at uh, the, the Dwell Sense at CMU. 
the Estrelita Project at UC Irvine studied the very low birth weight infants, high risk infants and their family caregivers using a cell phone to, to create things like a fussy meter so we could track when the baby's fussiness mattered to the mom and look at interventions in time. The young adults in the chronology team tried to find a way to address all the complexities of diet, exercise and balance of medications including some off-label and maybe never heard of medications that sometimes are used to treat complex diseases like Crohn's. For adults with uh, asthma, the Breathe Easy Project combined cellular phones, geo GPS technology, and inhaler devices to better understand when were people pulling on their rescue inhalers and when they weren't, and how did that affect their moods. And our In Touch team in South San Francisco worked with teens at risk for obesity, trying to figure out if there were ways that they could in the moment provide an understanding to the teen and to the, co the health coach what was happening with the person. The observations of daily living spanned a huge range. They spanned things like depression and mood to how many times the baby's diaper was changed, to bonding activities, who was in and out of the house. We understood, we listened to the patients and found that many of those things we were listening to, they really wanted just to be fed back to them. They really want to understand how their patterns in their daily lives affect their lives. But we also found that it mattered to their clinicians to know these observations of daily living in certain important cases. So I'll talk with you about one as I finish up. In the Breathe Easy group, this is in uh, a, a group of patients in the Center City Richmond. Steve Rothemich is our physician on this practice. Barbara Masudi from RTI was the lead on this project. They created a system where patients had a cell phone. They monitored things throughout the day. Uh, their, their mood, their, at, their number of rescue inhaler times that they, uh, rescue inhaler uses they had, their peak flow information. A clinician dashboard in the lower right hand corner shows you what was viewed each day by the nurse triage service at the institution and based on protocols either a patient was escalated up to come into the clinic was reassured that they're doing fine or a phone consultation was made now this became important notice on this chart here across the top we have peak flow values along the bottom lines we have a number of different observations when were you using your controller medications when were you using your rescue medication what asthma triggers were you exposed to levels of anxiety depression sleep were you smoking and what asthma symptoms did you have the green shows that things are all right the red shows that the symptoms are increasing. So notice that bottom line stays red. The person's medications are not working. Yet between the six month checks, it usually happens for people in this population, that would never have been detected. Notice that about halfway through, additional medication was added, a new controller medication was started, and we see an improvement in peak flows and a beginning of the disruption of the asthma symptoms. Again, possible because we listen to the person in their everyday lives. Notice that their sense of, of activity was also improving some. This is quite important as you try to manage medication. Here we have a different situation. This is a person who is in the community. Their peak flows actually look all right. They're in the green bar at the top, but we see asthma symptoms along the, the bottom and they're using their rescue meds all the time. What's going on here? So there was a plan to bring this person in, escalate their treatment, do a differential diagnosis, and additional services and resources were made available to them. In another case in the same population, a patient had confused their, in, their rescue inhaler and their maintenance inhaler and was taking the maintenance inhaler only for emergencies and the rescue inhaler every morning. This does not help control asthma. But understanding that and getting that information in daily practice goes far beyond saying, how are your meds doing today? Do you need any help with them? When you understand and you listen in the moment, you get to hear what the patient is experiencing. So I'll finish up with a couple challenges. Workflow integration remains a problem. What do you do with that information? Well, here it went to a dashboard. In other places, it goes to a PDF that remains in the chart. Sometimes the clinicians get worried. There could be something in that list that I haven't paid attention to and I could get stuck later on. That hasn't happened, but the fear remains. And until we can hold our clinicians safe for not knowing what they're not, it's not possible for them to know, we're not going to be able to effectively integrate the sounds of everyday living into the practice of the individual. We found that our architectural solutions are problematic still. We can capture lots of information on a cell phone, but no one, no one, no one in this country is going to receive information that got passed through a health fault account and put back into a clinical record system. They'll send it out, but they won't bring it back in in any integrated way that can be operated on. Certainly patients can self-report it. So we experimented with a number of different architectures and our website has some good descriptions about them. The bottom line is that we're, it's possible to achieve for patients this ability to support them and listen to them in everyday care. It's critical that we begin to do that. It can make our medication management better. It can bring patients into the care system quicker. 
or have them stay at home longer. I encourage you to look at the rest of our information on our website and also to please, during our conversation this afternoon, please raise all the questions and concerns you can possibly bring because it is through your hands that we will be able to listen to health in everyday lives. Thank you very much.